Welcome to another episode of the Creative Power Hour. I'm your host, Marcus Whitney, and today our guest is Wu Feng. Hey, how are you? Good. Thank you, Marcus. So great to have you. I didn't know if you were going to make it because you just got done with a really big trip. Yes, I just came back with my parents from China to Nashville about just three weeks ago. So, uh, and, and the timing for everyone who might be watching this a year from the day that we record it, uh, there's been some interesting things happening in the news re- recently between the United States and China. Oh, wow. It's, uh, it's kind of been, you know, like a, you know, relationship-y thing. Right. That, you know, like <laughs> when you have issues with your partner, it's, it's sort of that kind of like, should we love each other? Should, should we like argue? And it's just... Uh, yeah, it has not been easy for sure. Yeah, yeah, it has not been easy, and um, um, but I'm very glad that uh, my parents are here. It's amazing. It, it's yeah, it it, w- it w- took about uh, two years of family planning wow. for them to be here, uh, and uh, me and my husband we have two small children, so um, it's it's just a fantastic feeling that I have um, the three generations actually together. Um, it brings back. Um, family tradition the family value quite a bit instead of all right we're all independent let's just not kind of see each other only once a year sort of thing so uh, i see um everyone's actually feeling really um positive and healthy emotionally i'm so happy for you because <laughs> i i've had that experience myself uh with uh, we talked about it yeah. i moved my parents down here about 12 13 years ago and uh, it changed everything. You know, I was going through a pretty tough period in my life. My kids were, you know, approaching their teenage years. And, uh, you know, I don't know that we would have gotten through it if, if my parents hadn't been here. You Family. know, Family. Oh, Family is just so important. And I also think, like, it was great for them because Brooklyn, New York is a tough place for... Uh, aging people yeah. and I think them being here in Nashville just extended I don't want to talk about extended the length of their life but I think the quality of their life for the Absolutely. last decade has been fantastic so I'm so happy for you thank you uh, and I think this is also like a good segue uh you know given the fact that you know you've now sort of moved into a, a role of of sort of taking care of your parents you yeah. know let's let's talk a little bit about when they were taking care of you let's talk a little bit about your your origin story uh I was born and <laughs> raised in Beijing China um, and, uh, so as a, the first generation of the one child policy wow. from China, so I have no siblings, uh, by law, Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. now they have, uh, the Chinese government have, uh, abandoned that policy, um, just maybe two years ago. Yeah. However, just young couples aren't Can, can having, I ask a yeah. quick question about that, about mm-hmm. the one child policy? Um, I, I heard just this morning that the one child policy led to a skewing in the gender makeup because there were many, many more boys oh, yeah. uh, than, than girls that were born as that one child. Is yeah. that, that's correct? That's absolutely correct. It's scarily correct. <laughs> <laughs> wow. There are literally 30 million more men wow. in China than women. Wow. So a, a lot of it was caused by because of gender uh, uh culturally a uh, boy favorite culture yeah um so uh a lot of parents they would find out if um it was a boy or a girl uh, before the birth and then they would abort the the, the girl oh, uh, wow. or they would um maybe abandon there's a lot of see like there's a lot of um adopted children from yeah. china in the u.s and i think 80 maybe 90 percent of them are girls for the same no yeah. kidding oh yeah it's that also that from that period um, they're all wow. from like age of mostly like five or six to now 25 to 26. So this is from a similar period as well. Um, so that's that's a huge problem right now in in China. It's just uh, how do you solve that problem? Wow. You know, when, when you try to manipulate population and gender and then later, what are you going to do? There's like a, a bride trafficking in Southeast Asia into China because there's, there's a lack. Yeah. And 30 million, that's a nation on its own. Wow. Speaking of number. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, so, but when I grew up, because I was the first generation of a single child policy, so the culture kind of changed quite a bit, even if it was um, still uh, 
the culturally it was boy favorite culture. However, I was raised, uh, born and raised in Beijing, in big cities, um, because we had more, much better resources in, in terms of education and uh, um, all other stuff. So um, girls were, there was also a lot of liberal parents. So um, a lot of the girls like me were expected to achieve as boys. So that's how I was wow. raised. So wow. that's how I was raised. Wow. Uh, I was raised like a Mulan. Like, you know, I, <laughs> boys, whatever boys can do, I can do. Like, I, I go on the battle zone, I get the battle done. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a, so I was raised. Um, so my past, basically as a music musician, uh, was chosen by my parents when I was three and a half years old. And uh, start taking lessons um, when I was five. So basically, um, I remember one, I think maybe I was four and a half ish, um, two professor, music professors, uh, there were friends of my dad. My dad is a musician. And uh, they came to my house and they uh, um, basically, they touched my bones, my fingers, and touched my shoulders and test my pitches and test my um, rhythm. They're like, okay. She can learn music. She can do it. She can do it. And then that's how I, but at that time, I didn't realize what they were doing to me. But they were just like a testing, like a, a little athlete. Oh Before you gosh. are an athlete, we need to make sure that you physically qualify to become a music athlete. Wow. So that's how I got in. That was the first day. So ever since then, then I've never not do music in my life. Wow. That was the day. So, so what, was the, what was it, I mean, if that was the start, mm -hmm. what was it like from there? Like, how many hours a day? Like, oh like what was... Oh, my goodness. <laughs> uh, I, I still want to thank my parents, okay? So, but back then, uh, it was a very struggling childhood I had. Um, minimum, I think, start when I was five years old. Minimum, every day was uh, two hours a day. Uh, wow. Two hours of practice. From five years old. Yeah. And that was just like during the semester. But when it's winter and summer break, then um, it increased to four to six hours a day. And if there were, I was joining competition, then sometimes I was practicing eight hours a day. So that was just uh, the normal thing. I don't even know what to say to that. It was, it, it, it sucked. But, uh, I, you know, like it really, I mean, no one wants to. I was locked inside the house um, just to practice because they, they were both working. Yes. And that they couldn't have a babysitter. And then they just locked the door and then made the food there. So I, I was expected to practice all day long. But one day, actually, I was so, like, you know, with the house, I, actually, I had to jump out the window because I was listening to other kids, like, kicking ball in the outside. Oh, I want to be part of it. So I jumped over the window, and then my neighbor saw me, like, this, uh, kind of, I called him uncle. And he, and, like, he's like, oh, he didn't say anything. And I, I think he, he felt really bad for me because, you know, he had kids, too. Yeah. So he didn't tell my parents yeah. that he saw me jumping out of the window, escaping from the yeah, house. Yeah, he was like, poor Faye, like, go, yeah, no, no, go. like, I won't tell your parents. <laughs> yeah. So that was um, basically um, my um, entire childhood. A very, yeah, uh, my father, I mean, he, both of my parents went through the Cultural Revolution. So they were the generation, I have to say something about their generation, is that um, they really went through the toughest um, time of contemporary Chinese history mm -hmm. that um, they, the country was in chaos for a long time um, and it was a scary time. And uh, so my mother um, was sent away because her family background was the capitalist and the landlord background. So at that time, um, it was considered bad. So, um, so because of her family background, she was sent to uh, a far away for six years to be um, in the re-education camp uh, for six years. Uh, when she, you know, from like a mid late teen to mid twenties, basically the best age that you're supposed to receive education. And then, you know, so it's like they really went through some really. I'm there. We were still talking about this like a few days ago that they're lucky that they survived. They didn't either kill themselves or didn't get killed or they survived so i mean i feel like in the west we um like we make television and movies about things like this but they always have you know like the the writers will always tell you you know nothing in this show has never been done in humanity before right, right you know right. what i mean and um these are just stories that like i don't know we just don't hear yeah it's uh i think um 
I mean, even like my mother, um, since they arrived in the States, she has told me a few things that she, you didn't know. I didn't know because now she feels she's not scared anymore. She yeah, can tell me. she can talk without like they're not listening. Right, there's, or there's, someone's there's, there's, listening. There's, yeah, but there's no. I may get in trouble or right. you know whatever, and uh, so it just like in my family, everyone just w- would not talk about these things until like okay, one person they think have kind of escaped that sort of thing. Yeah. And, uh, so, um, so that's so their generation um, is so um, I would say so traumatized from what they went through and, and a lot of the chunk of their life. Um, so when China uh, calmed down, when I was born, China was ready to, you know, like, let's just, um, for, you know, either forget about the bad history and then let's time to pr- pr- make progress. So that's when I was born. And uh, so they um, felt the only way that I could have a better life was to work really hard and to you know be disciplined really hard so um no chance to fail and yeah, you know just yeah. like don't do everything straight A's and score everything number one and that's the only yeah, way because they loved you and they wanted yeah you yeah. to be able to navigate yes. this world yeah yeah so but back then you know i when i was a kid i could understand you know now i'm a parent i understand but back then i had a lot of struggle with my parents because like i just didn't want to practice and i wanted i was a kid and the two hours sitting you know in front of the, the zither and the, or the piano was just too long yeah and uh but uh i had no choice yeah i had no i just I had no choice and so that um, but those years of solid um, practice, um, discipline, oh <laughs> really, gosh. like, I can't unlearn that. Well, I, okay, mean. I, I, have, I have one just <laughs> nitpicky question. Did you have weekends, like, off? No. Or did you work through weekends? Yeah, weekends. Yeah, like, different maths school and then private lessons and like and then ear training, a music, a theory, class, and then, like, just kind of three different locations. And then the the only rest of the afternoon is like practice. So that's pretty much, I didn't, yeah, yeah. But that's what everyone was doing. Yeah. And, uh, what, what, what was, what were, what were relationships like as a child in China with that kind of schedule? Like what, what were, what were your friendships like? Uh, I, 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 hmm. I had a good friends, but we were all single children, so we all probably somehow emotionally a little crippled because we we only hung out at school. We wanted to go to each other's houses, but all our parents prohibited us from, re, uh, you know, wow. having friends because it's just like weird. And uh, and everyone had a small apartment, so it's not like tons of place. But we all um, like to. S- not go home after school so and it was like really safe actually we, so we uh, had like a jumping rope game and uh, just play as late as we could but we know um at, at least i knew that if i don't get home enough i have to practice i have to fulfill two hours of practice if i go to home late that means i have to go to bed late mm-hmm. <laughs> so uh, mm-hmm. um but yeah we, we did have friendship but it wasn't it's very different from here yeah. friends like our family were, they weren't our friends, but they were definitely the closest to us. Yeah. Our friends, I don't know. It's a, yeah, it's a, it's a very different culture. I, I do, I have still keep friends with maybe a few Was people. it much more important to have, because there were only one child per family, was mm. it much more important to like, like, did you have cousins? Yes, we. Uh, I did. Yeah. And the cousin relationships very strong. How, how strong, was that? Yeah, it was strong uh, because we all lived in Beijing. I think that the fact that we all, the whole clan, lived in Beijing and we got to see each other not very often, still just once a year, I would say, during Chinese New Year. Really? Yeah, yeah. Everyone was so busy. Um, yeah, the culture had changed so much. Wow. I think my when my dad was young, they hung out with each other so much more than my generation. Yeah. My generation was probably kids are expected to achieve so much. What what is the what is the narrative that's going on in the country around achievement? Like achieve what for who? What's what's the what is the rallying cry and the cause and you know and who's the protagonist in this story and like what it's definitely not achieved for your own dream. Yeah, I always say it's uh, 
just carry. I, w- I think that the culture of faith is is the biggest. It's like you carry the family name. If you have made your family proud, and that's、um, you are praised the highest.、Um, forget about your own dream.、Mm-hmm. Um, But、uh, you, and we have a word called、uh, 孝顺 Ah,、uh, 孝顺 is like in Chinese value is the biggest virtue of of a human kind in Chinese culture, which means you、uh, fulfill your family's dream and you obey your family's、uh, rules and you look after your family. And if you have fulfilled all of these, then you are the best person.、Mm. <laughs> but I mean, and it's definitely is changing. But that 孝顺 that's like. A、two, three thousand years of heaviness、mm. in our culture. It's um, yeah, it's very difficult to explain. So, I would say it's it's to achieve um always the highest, the best. Sacrifice your own, you know, dream <laughs> or what? Just I mean, the culture is like don't think about your own dream. It's like doesn't matter. Yeah, it's like if if what yeah, you what are you talking about? Yeah, like if you can make a million, make a million. You know, but if you make a million, but your friend is making ten million, like compared to your friend, you know, yeah, <laughs> that's yeah, a, yeah. If you have five houses, but he has eight houses, that compared to that, so that's like the mentality, like you're super competitive. Yeah, it's a、uh, yeah.、Um, if I like basically from my um uh my my upbringing was、uh, elementary school. If I score um. A、test if 100 from my from my father's standard. If I score 100, I'll get I will be complimented by my father. Okay. If I get 99, no compliment, no criticism. If I get 98, that's when criticism will come in, and anything below 98 is not acceptable. Yes,、yeah, so, I mean we're not even in the criticism now. Now yeah, like, they're like you this have is so a, disrespectful. Yeah, it's just such a sh- what 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 happened there? How? Could you ever get an ID seven point five? That's like shameful.、Oh. Yeah, that's a yeah. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes I score so low, like eighty two, like a couple times in my life. Yeah. And and then you have to actually、um, every important test you have to have your I, I, hold parents' on, hold on, hold signature. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I faked my just, parents' just for signature. The, just for the right, you just said sometimes I got an eighty two a couple times in my life. I mean. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's like I've those eighty-two tests. I faked my parents' signature because I was so you, afraid. Like, like, no way am I taking this home. No, no way. way. Yeah, I faked my parents' signature at the school's bathroom. So I remember like putting the 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 paper. Uh, the test paper on the ground and faking it, and then but the door, you know, you can see the bottom. So when I finish and I open the door and I saw my friend, the classmate staring at me, I was like, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, ah, I was doing the same thing. Was, oh, okay,、uh, that's good.、Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's a that's a very common childhood all over China. Wow. And that was that's not even the worst. Like, there's just a, it's a culture that you know it's a. It's, it has created some of the world's most、um, amazing result. However, the price, you know,、yeah. every child, every person, every family, the sacrifice,、um, you know, it's like there's extreme pros comes with extreme cons. Yeah, it 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 can't just be one way. Yeah. <laughs> so so <laughs> how how okay? <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I'm so.、Uh, I'm so taken back by that. So, how do you see what's beyond what you're experiencing? Like what? Like what is the first glimmer of? I don't want to say the outside world, but、mm. like, you know, knowing you from and, and and the life that you have today, like it is very hard. I mean, I get it because you're you are such you're such a master at your craft,、um, but. So that part makes sense, but、yeah. you're completely adjusted. Yeah, you, you know, at least externally. Maybe internally, maybe、yeah. not, but externally, you're very adjusted. So, what is the? F- you know, you're a child. You're raised in this. This is just the way that it is. What is the beginning of you seeing the outside、More. world and knowing that, like, this is not the entirety of life? Uh, I have to say, um, 
subconsciously, I when I was back in China before I left China, um, when I was like maybe in early twenties, um, there's always something in me that I wanted to go somewhere else to see the world, but I also got to look after my parents and. Uh, so somehow I just took care of them um, the best way I could. And then um, I told them, you know, I, I just got to go leave for a while. And then I want to see the rest of the world. And at that time, America was this, you know, it's like we call it Deng Ta Guo in Chinese. It means it's like the light tower country. It's like that's where you want to, you know, sail to. So uh, and, and I applied for university and got scholarship, uh, you know, for a good student, it's not that hard. So you just like yeah. master on taking exams and be the best and then you get it. So that's how I just like kind of sail through everything uh, academically. Uh, and then when I came to the States, also because music has been entire, um, the entire um, my um, life basically, um, also from the very strict um, conservatory training. Yeah. Um, from Chinese traditional to Western classical, uh, I, I, I learned a lot about what's um, outside of Chinese uh, music um, from basically still, but it, mostly it was Western classical. But one day um, I remember um, in China, we, we didn't have the, the original CDs or cassette tapes. There was just like a parroted stuff that had like a clip on the side, like a little hole. So, uh, uh, it was just faked ones. But one, one day I listened to this one cassette tape. It blew my mind. And then it was the Kronos Quartet playing um, Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I was like, what? This is exactly what I want. <laughs> that cassette tape was, you know, <laughs> Kronos Quartet playing Jimi Hendrix. Wow, that was so magnificent. Um, so at that time, I was like, oh, they're American musicians. Hmm. You know, I started to yeah. think. And then that's a really, that sound, it was let me uh, come to the States and wanting to just, just to, to, to find that sound. How old were you when you heard that? I th uh, oh, I was probably 17, 18. Okay. Yeah, wow. I was quite old. Yeah, you know? yeah, First yeah. time, I was blown away from like, you know, the traditional, like, bum, 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 yeah. to like, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> it was so cool and uh and then i came to the states um i w i was blown away by the first thing i saw uh was a, a ghanaian african western uh western african drumming and dance ensemble and then um, northern indian raga <laughs> and then marching band even i was like and then jazz so uh I was like, wow, this is the best. Yeah. I, even just like by eating different kind of food, you know, the nutrients started kicking in and uh, I felt that's what I needed. So, and I discovered improvisation. You know, that's like, you know, now I realize, you know, without improvisation, you get up. The moment you, you wake up, getting up from bed, you start improvising. Otherwise, yeah, like, right. what are you doing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, toothbrush, mm -mm. you have like a robot, you can't do that. So, um, um, but I had to find actually what I want to speak in music because um, that was a, like also a painful process that um, I was put on the music path, not from my own choice. Yeah, yeah. You know, it is yeah. so anti-music, right? Yeah. It's like so anti-art. Yeah. And for the longest time, um, no one in China asked me what I wanted, why I write music. That doesn't matter. Or that didn't even ever occur mm -hmm. in any musician's life mm -hmm. or music uh, student's life mm -hmm. that I know of. Until and then I came to the States and then my first professor asked me, why do you compose? I'm like, uh, what? What kind of question is that? Like, uh, to be like you, maybe? <laughs> to be a professor, to get a job? Yeah. And, uh, that's, so, but that really, that question really shocked me. So uh, um, I had a, I, I went to pretty deep depression for a while. Just, to, you know, it's like supposedly the most expressive human way to, you know, just like, ah, you are angry, just yell it out. Like, I had to be trained to ah, express anger angrily. <laughs> and, uh, so that, uh, and then, but once um, I kind of came over, uh, came around that stage and uh, I just felt like I was already, I think, 20, 
24, 25 ish, um, when I was questioned why I do music, <laughs> not knowing how to answer that question. Wow. So I thought, you know what? I'm too old to learn something new, like a skill or yeah. a craft. I think I have to give it a try to like to let go because my professors are like, you have to let go. Like you don't need a craft anymore. You need to let that those burdens go yeah. to, to just try it out. So that's when I decided, okay, I'm going to just uh, cut, cut my past from me to see what comes to me. And, and then that's when magic started to happen. And then I just, can never stop anymore because it's so I find myself yeah so now and living through um becoming older now I'm 42 um I've also lived through a different period of my life and that had uh, ups and downs so um I think maybe I'm also um I, I don't know I just um I felt uh also living and learning other people's stories and seeing other people suffering and really made me realize a lot of things that I don't hold a lot of uh, resentment for to my parents. Mm -hmm. I mean, still, there's like a little, you know, like kind of a bickery, you know, sort of, but it's your family. It's your family. Yes, yeah, your family. And it's always sort of like mm, pinchy. Sure, 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 sure. But still, like knowing... I was learning a lot about history. Yeah. The history back in China, what happened to them. And also now, since uh, I've come to the States, um, learning American history and learning other people's suffering. Yeah. And and just to, to have my own way to to analyze, to to feel sympathy. And it's all human, humanity. Yeah. So I feel like I'm... Just like, wow, you know, I, I'm one of the very lucky ones. So there's not, I, every day is a gift. So that's how I turn around. <laughs> yeah, so living, I think living as, as well. Yeah. Besides the music uh, connections, collaborating is, I think, really um, becoming more matured and, and living with more experience and meet, meeting people really get, has given a lot of depth. When did you meet your husband, Jeremy? I met him in 2007, but that's that's not when we started dating. We uh, he his company he was in Beijing, and uh, their company interviewed me when I uh, premiered a piece um, in Beijing. I was still living in the states, uh -huh. and uh, but two years later um, we saw each other again and we started dating. And uh, so that's that's been a decade. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, I, I just wanted to frame that up because you all have a lovely family, and I just wanted to yeah, sort of know yeah. from a timing perspective. So, okay, so the reason why I wanted you to be the first musician on the show is because I've seen you perform several times now. What's really mm -hmm. cool is that uh -huh. uh, it's never the same, <laughs> right? So, th so the first time I saw you perform was at uh, uh, Oz Con Conversations at Oz. It was you and Ab Abigail. All right. Do you, right, right. do you remember that? Yeah, yeah, the 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 dinner, the, the best dinner, the dinner, yes. the dinner. Yeah. Yes. So that was the first time. Yeah. And that was that was really cool. And then it was the then we did the al album listening party for Woo Force. Oh yeah. Which yeah. was like super different. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then the the most recent time. Hello, Go Mountain. Yes. Which was <laughs> basically different. Yeah, it was entirely different, and also um, it was just you so the, the the other two were collaborations and were awesome but this one it wasn't just you this was a collaboration with chatterbird which, yeah. which i get but yeah. like but i scored the you entire scored music. the yeah. music every right? note yeah. you scored it yeah. and um i have to say it it was I, i've had one other person on on this on the show caroline randall williams where it was me realizing okay this is what master level looks like this <laughs> like you. this is what master level looks like uh the 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 command of the medium master level and you also were able to really infuse yourself and your emotion you were telling someone else's story but like your yeah. my, that's my my your, yeah. yeah your emotion yeah. was yes. was yeah. coming yes. through it um and that is just such 
an incredible gift. And there's an incredible similarity between your story and Caroline's is just how early all this stuff started, right? How yeah. how early the development of, yeah. of, your, of, of, of your mastery of the craft. Like, you yeah. know, it's, it started young. It started yeah, young. Yeah, 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 yeah. These kind of, um, um, I would say, either um, virtuo virtuosic kind of skills, and it's kind of like a language that the younger you learn, the more natural, and then the less likely you're going to forget. Yeah. So that's a kind of, um, yeah. I, but, and, you know, it can be very painful childhood. You've got to practice so much. But, hey, you know, the benefit is, like, you just you can just pluck anything. You just come out. You can't stop. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and also, like, most of my training actually was um, composition writing for chamber orchestra. So um, that was the, my primary when, training. When, when did you start composition writing? Like at what age? I would say um, nine or ten. I mean, that is just like what? Yeah, are we that's like about what here? Mozart did. Yeah. What are we talking about here? Nine years old, you started I, to composing. write like like yeah, small things on a piano, on a like a, like scoring everything, and do like a motif turn into a little like theme and variation. That was just part of the the because I was already going to the conservatory weekend school to study uh, theory and ear training and solfege. So uh, uh, that was just part of the practice. So you know, we didn't even realize what we were doing. Right. You know, we're just like, <laughs> all right, let me just see if I can. And part of the training is um, when we were maybe 12 or 13, we started writing for um, choral music and uh, um, also to imitate style. Let's say, like, our teacher will say, okay, this week, all of you write a piano solo piece that's, that's going to sound like Chopin. So we're like, okay. And then we will, next, we'll come back with the piece. Were you trained on the style, or did you have to deconstruct the style first? Like, we, how, we, did, how did we that usually, work? Usually, we have, by then, we have listened, th th listened to a lot of, um, and then played a lot of um, the, that composer's piece. Yeah. And then analyze it and learn history, learn his you know, not just Chopin's music history, but Chopin's love story. And, you know, to learn thoroughly what kind of a person he was. Mm -hmm. And then to, you know, and then, like write something that sounds like his waltz. And, yeah. Uh, but, you know, when we were kids, it still like didn't probably really sound like him. But we kind of pretend that we're Chopin. Okay. <laughs> and uh, just kind of imitate all of So that was also part of the training is to like each month or a week um our one of our teachers will give us an assignment to um uh, to 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 write a piece uh, for style uh learning as well uh, and then um i now i see is it's quite an interesting practice cuz um it's is another different kind of mastery on just knowing so many styles and then you can let go you know what's out there and yeah. then you can let go and then you can Mix things, but um, you know, in in a in a more of a higher way than just a sort of like gluing things together. Um, but it, it, yeah, so that's part of the part. A lot of, or and we we study um, Bach's um, counterpoint music very thoroughly. We took a whole year to study his music and to like peel like onion layer and then to do a deconstruct his entire piano pieces and then to learn like mathematically. And then we learn, and then we put our own thing just to sound like um, him. First practice to sound like Bach, and then the second practice is to use his theory, but sounding like ourselves. Mm. And uh, like mathematically has to be perfect. Also, it needs to sound. It needs to bring tears down as well. <laughs> so that was a quite a. So that was a lot of the training before I was. Um, 18 like from 15 to 20 there was like entirely those training i was to do that and <laughs> i mean that that makes that makes so much sense as to why you're able to do what you're able to do today so um let's talk about the instrument mm. okay so the gujung yes okay yes Perfect. so mm -hmm. so this 
I'd never, se- I probably seen it on television. Mm-hmm. You know, I, look, I, I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. I, right. I was exposed to lots of things. Yeah. But like, I don't think I like ever really saw this instrument because it's a large. Yeah. It's inst- like as long as this table. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. a large instrument. Mm-hmm. So you would have to be somewhere where somebody had it set up. Right. You know right. what I mean? Like no one's like walking around playing that. Right. Thing, right. right. Yeah. And that's not like a flute. Yeah. 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 How many strings? 21. 21. Mm-hmm. Such so. an incredible, <laughs> incredible instrument. So talk a, talk a little bit about the history of the instrument. How many hundreds of years old is it? Um, it's at least, um, I would say, 2,500 years of history. Wow. Yeah, because the earliest Guzheng score is 2,000 years old. Wow. Yeah, it was, <laughs> and it was uh, yeah, the, the music, the noted music, it, the earliest is 2,000 years old. Okay. So uh, that's, um, um, but back then at the beginning, it was only, it was much smaller. It had eight strings. And then um, uh, maybe a thousand years later, it became uh, 12 strings. Another okay. thousand years later and got to 16 strings. So even from the 1960s, 16 string guzheng was the most popular. Oh, wow. Yeah. Five so, have been added since the 60s. Yes. And because I think um, China, um, when China w- opened up to the, the, the world uh, basically just right before I was born and there was a lot of sentiment about um, like you know being uh, progressive and modernization so a lot of m- more strings added to it and uh, and another purpose is to be able to play with western classical orchestra okay. or western um, instruments or in, in rock or jazz and so um, the more strings, it just kind of make more sense. Mm. So that's when um, technique as well on the guzheng. The traditionally was more left hand on the left side to make the bending, like mm, mm, a lot of those kind of action and then vibrato. But once um, uh, I, I was born maybe 40 years ago or even 50 years ago, because the modernization and westernization in, in uh, China back then, um, the left hand started to come over to the right hand to play almost like piano, like, yeah. you know, yeah. as fast as you can. Um, so, I mean, you know, was, uh, craft-wise, it got really fast. However, it, it kind of lost some of the old flavor because the left hand is always over here, and then but the bending is really where the history sounds like. Um, so that's the the, the instrument. Um, it's still progressing right now, and a lot of um, you know new thinking kind of invention wanted to make the instrument even kind of cooler or more complicated and bigger. Uh, so that's um, that's a uh, guzheng, and uh, even if it's um, still quite quite unknown in the West, it is the national instrument in China. That's exactly <laughs> what I was about to go to. I was about to say like it's the instrument in China. It, it is but, the. But in the West, in America, very rare, right? Right, right, right. Uh, well, it's changing, uh, but I, I kind of, even the Arhu is becoming more popular. The two-string bow in yeah. Chinese violin, a lot of in, in jazz and folk um, uh, American music. I feel like to, I see that more. Yeah, like like smaller and then bowed like that. Yeah. Yeah. The guzheng is just size-wise so big. Right. It's just hard to travel. Right. Yeah. Right. So that is like a kind of a... And I would imagine also the number of strings because it's so many more strings than the typical Western instrument. Yeah. It's just intimidating. I, like, I, <laughs> I, I would imagine, right? I mean, like... It's, I guess uh, it can be intimidating, but I never <laughs> think like that. Just, yeah, I think we've already explained why <laughs> you're not intimidated by it. I mean, goodness. There's a lot of, I mean, also, you know, one, one interesting aspect I actually want to bring it up is um, the gender issue. Like in, in, in China, how I grew up, first of all, music is considered as a feminine thing. So it's uh, incur- girls are encouraged to study music. Oh. Guys are encouraged to study engineering and business. Ah. So like music, arts, and language uh, education is more of like a women thing. So I grew up with literally like you know all my music training, my music time in the conservatory. Eighty percent were always girls. Wow. So what about the teachers? The teachers will have and have. Okay. Because the teachers, yeah, because back then it was more of a man thing. Okay. And my okay. Guzheng teacher, one was uh, an old uh, man and an old lady. Um, but yeah, it was still a lot more men prof- music professors from our professor's generation. But from our generation, uh, I grew up with like 80% music students who were girls. So I felt like, hmm. This is so unspecial. Like we have, have so few men um, in you know just all throughout music 
uh, academy. And uh, so when I came to the States, first thing, I felt like, wow, I'm the one of the only, like, there's an only another girl in the whole composition class. Yeah. Uh, maybe there were like uh, 30 kids and me and this other girl, the only women. So at that time, I was actually really happy because I finally, I'm not competing with like 80 girls <laughs> in my life because I always competed with like 80 girls in my life. And, uh, but, and then the longer I lived here, I started to realize this is also the gender manipulation culturally that women, you know, because back then the China also, because it's not because we or the individual wanted to learn it, it's because we're women, we should learn music. Yeah, and right. Here it's like, you had okay, no choice. Right. There, here is like, okay, you are girls, so you shouldn't learn music. It's, you know, it's sort of like, it's a, even if the, on the surface the, the result is the opposite result, but it's the, the same it's gendered, the same, same yes. um, manipulation or 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 this like a man uh, uh, dominated culture yes. telling women what to do. Yes. basically design. Okay, you, you are women. You got to do this. Yes, you are better to do this for society. Yes, <laughs> so very frustrating. So after I learned that, I stopped you know liking the fact that there's so few women in in the music festivals, the music major, and uh, so struggling. Um, so that's a, I started to feel like, okay, there's something I, I, I should do. And uh, each concert I play and I saw more young girls with their mother, with their fathers too. And then, um, I felt like, wow, this is not just, uh, um, it, it, it is, uh, inspiring somehow. And, uh, so that's when I also learned about, um, these things in, about culture and society, uh, it also makes me more like kind of have much more understanding of, of human relationship. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Talk a little bit about the the most recent project. Uh, I I, th I think the yeah. most recent one was yes. the collaboration with Chatterbird. Yes. 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 Okay. Hello, Go Mountain. Yes. yes. It's a uh, it's a, uh, a chamber orchestra piece that I wrote. Um, in, in the inspiration came from. Uh, the Second War, the Second World War, uh, in Europe, there were m uh, more than 20,000 Jewish refugees um, uh, fled to Shanghai, where it was the on one of the only two cities in the world that uh, allowed them to come in. Um, and uh, so there was, um, so I didn't find out about that history. It's such a, like a, you know, a big scale and, so, and so heavy. There's and so much to that. So much to, to, the, that. to those words you just said. There is so much to that. I, I, I didn't learn. China didn't, you know, it, it wasn't taught in Chinese right. history. It wasn't taught in the U.S. history book. Right. Like, no one knew about it. So I, I found out um, from watching a documentary film called Shanghai Ghetto, um, probably 10 years, well, more than 10 years, 15 years ago, actually. Um, and... I just thought, you know, from the the cover of it was sort of like a cassette or DVD thing. Um, from the cover, I was like, you know, European-looking people, but in during the war, obviously, in in a Chinese city, I was like, oh, I have got to check it out. And then, of course, it was just it was so touching and so heavy, and I probably used a whole box of tissues <laughs> from watching it. So, but that piece, I mean, that um, when I learned about. Um, the history, it wasn't the time that I said, okay, I'm going to just write a big orchestra piece for it. It just, you know, it's like it, it was in me somehow and then, you know, changed me in a very profound way. And then later, uh, it might also have resulted me um, being with my husband, who is a South African Jew, and, uh, and learning and, and being married to him and to marry into the family, I've learned so much from my in-law side that this is no more just from the book, from the movies. This it's is personal. like, this is it's, personal. It's personal. Yeah, yeah. You know, every time they talk about it, they like, their tears and they're, they lost their relative, they lost their siblings. And so, and that, ha and then um, me becoming a mother, um, moving back to the States, mm at a very interesting time and um it just all came out um that way that um and then ready to resume 
writing music, you know, because also being a mother kind of slowed me down for a few years. <laughs> but I'm like, hey, when I'm back, I'm going to be back. So this is <laughs> the comeback piece. <laughs> <laughs> so, and the, but you know, also let's just I wanted to leave something for my children as well. Yeah. Like, um, and uh, so they know their origins and they know the suffering of not only um, their own um, families, but also to have um, sympathy towards other people. And uh, so, hopefully, you know, these kind of thing will never happen again. Sure. And, uh, so we got to start. So, um, so that's the uh, inspiration. Um, and then um, musically, Gu Zheng, of course, um, not only is my main instrument, it's also um, a represent uh, the Chinese culture uh, as well as the, it's, it's, uh, it's all over Asia. There's, Japan has Japanese uh, version of Zither, and Korea has Korea's version, and Mongolia, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, they all had their own version of my instrument. Mm -hmm. So, and, and my good friend, Shanir Blumenkrantz, who's an amazing musician from Brooklyn as well. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, man, just Brooklyn talented. It's just like lots of overfloating. Talented. Lots of talent <laughs> in Brooklyn. Know, this is true. Also, yeah. So he, um, he's a master on the oud. The oud is also from, uh, originated from um, Middle East and North Africa, like the old region from... Um, no, before we called Africa, it was just like 4,000 yeah, years yeah, ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Th those two region. things were just kind of so, melded yeah, together. Yeah, yeah. And then it's throughout Central, uh, Middle East, North Africa, and Central Asia. Is so, it like, like Tunisia, like yeah. that area? Oh, kind of? yeah, 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 yeah. So there's like the, the, the Jewish uh, Oud, and there's the Turkish Oud, there's the Arabic Oud. So yeah. they all are related and just maybe a little like a tuning differently with uh -huh. the scale or the, the flats and... And uh, so the oud represents um, the Jewish culture also throughout um, uh, and, uh, throughout uh, Europe as well, because the uh, Ashadabur, the classical ensemble, represents the particular Jewish refugees who went to Shanghai. Most of them were from Austria and uh, Germany and later Poland. So those Jews, when they were, um, before they fled mm -hmm. during the Second War, they were living the highest um, cultural and musical life in the entire contemporary European wow. history. So like Webern, Anton Webern, and Schoenberg, and uh, so the, the, the highest uh, Western classical music and compositional culture was happening in Vienna. Mm. So they really, so the, 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 the classical music it was huge part of their life, and, and themselves they were um, cellists and concert pianists. And besides, they were actually they're doctors. They're also amazing cellists and uh, on their own. So there's a lot of quite a few famous Jewish composers and uh, classical musicians fled to Shanghai and taught music there to um, Chinese pupils back then, who later became the first generation after Mao took over the first music professors after the people's republic of china wow so so that wow. was actually were pupils wow. of yeah, this yeah, so yeah, the yeah. connection that, that connection's heavy that's it's, really heavy so uh it was uh um so i did a lot of research and then just like the more i learn about I mean, that, it i mean that just ties right back into uh, like you in a yeah in a yeah, crazy way yeah 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 now it's um, not through marriage now it's like no through, no yeah through the music rearing. yeah yeah the the first uh orchestral conductor of modern china uh, Li De Lun, uh professor Li De Lun, he was my conducting teacher's teacher and wow. he was one of the pupils taught by the jewish refugee musicians in shanghai I don't yeah. think I got that part of it. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, there was so much going on mm -hmm. in the lobby where we were all like learning about mm -hmm. this. I didn't get that part. That's so that was nuts. Uh, that, that was just uh, oh, I, yeah, wow. yeah. Okay. So, uh, so when I so there's a lot of really um, very dear personal relationship uh, relation between me, um, family, and history, and music, and uh, my teacher, and to this. Uh, particular historical event that um, I just, f I mean, it, it shows, I, I believe it shows in my music that how strong I feel mm -hmm. um, to the music. Um, and that's how also when I take on a project, um, I, I'm not like a overly producing, you know, like number wise. Yeah. But I just have to really, f you know, it, 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 it pounds my heart that I know something good will yeah. come out. Yeah. 
so uh, that this is one of yeah I would say yeah yeah I, I'm now I'm brewing I mean I'm still like you know sh going to share this piece with the rest of the world but I'm also kind of start to you know live again to have the next y y hype y yeah, again. yeah it needs to come into Naturally. your life and organically yeah yeah I, I I don't like to just read something to borrow something and then you know I have no really personal relationship to it and then I try to kind of fake that I understand it. Uh, I'm not out I just I can't do that so uh, it has to emotionally make sense to me and then it, it's it's yeah that's how I think immortal mu music we're writing you know it just got to hit the humanity and and, yeah. and so that's that's kind of where you are now, right? Like yeah. like you, you you just gave birth. Yeah, birth. Uh, yeah, I'm to, I'm, to I'm like maternal leave a little bit, <laughs> recovering, <laughs> and uh, not leave, but uh, you know I'm I just need to have the thing to come to me. But I know it's it's gonna come out somehow because just reconnecting with my family and seeing them um, being in America and uh, um, the, the my parents who used to be the stronger ones in the family yeah. brought me up and now they're like my uh, third and fourth children yeah that sort of thing. there's gonna be a whole new chapter that's yeah, going yeah, to yeah, come yeah, out yeah, of this yeah yeah so uh, and you're starting to hear these new stories that you'd never heard before yeah. because now your mother yeah. feels free to free speak to, yeah yeah so oh, uh wow. so i think that's it, exciting yeah for, it us, is. For, for those of us who are fans <laughs> of yours it's like ooh, something's coming something's coming <laughs> something's coming yeah yeah so uh I, i'm really excited and uh and Nashville is just a fantastic place to be, yeah, to raise family and to allow myself to have space and to actually just think, not just to like, all right, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? I, so I actually want to end on that on that point. I want to ask you about collaborations. Mm -hmm. On your website, collaborations is mm -hmm. like, it's its own section, right? Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? It's, it's So obviously it's important to you yeah. and, uh, and you have just a, a wealth of incredible people to collaborate with here in mm -hmm. Nashville when oh, it comes yeah. to music. But talk to me about like, uh, I mean, it, it feels like when you collaborate with people and you and Abigail, I think is a special thing. You mm. all are basically like sisters from different mothers, right? Yeah, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. But, but just talk to me about like how you approach collaboration. You know, what, what is, what, what are some of the principles that you bring to your collaborative work? Hmm, interesting question. So far, all the collaborators, I somehow just happen organically. I, I happen to be in a, you know, New York, or I was introduced maybe by um, good friends. Yeah. And uh, um, I had, for example, with um, my friend Billy Martin, who's um, the Madesi Martin Wood. Uh, I listened to his band's music when I was much younger, but I never even knew Billy was. The, the Martin in yeah, the band, yeah, and yeah. then uh, our mutual friend actually Zorn, uh, John Zorn in uh, New York introduced us. I was like, "Oh, you are a, a percussionist." So like, but then and then uh, not knowing he's actually from Mendesky Martin Wood, um, which I think probably was a good thing. Was yeah, like, right, yeah, 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 yeah. You weren't like what? freaking out, but yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so there was a lot of, or I was in a, a music festival in. Um, in Sardinia, and then there was another um, artist from Mali playing the Quora, and uh, we were both there, and we just start playing together. Um, so it was kind of always happened organically, not like, all right, I'm going to choose someone today yeah, to yeah, see yeah, yeah, who yeah. I like. It, it never happens, but uh, because my uh, my music has been so, like, this is just all I, when I go out of work, I meet musicians. And then, you know, you, you, you feel like, oh, one day someone just click. A lot of us through um, just improvising together. Yeah. Just uh, um, um, uh, especially like this one with Shanir. Um, it's, it, it just, when you start playing with him, you're just like, wow, I have to play with him again. Yeah. This guy is amazing. <laughs> it's just, uh, it, it, you can't explain, but you just know it. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and just... Or when I play with someone, like for example, when I play with Fred Frith, who's my um, teacher at Mills College when I was in California, uh, I did a master's in music composition there, and he was my main teacher. And when I played with him, I felt I was uplifted to a different world. Wow. And that I had never played so good that I, and it just happened naturally. 
So that I know, okay, I have to keep playing with Fred. Yeah. So he made me a better musician. And uh, so things are either like when you play is effortless or you become better. <laughs> and that's, uh, that's when magic and you just stay in touch and then finding cool objects. I mean, a project to work together. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. With Abby, I mean, like also throughout the years and uh, knowing each other's um, culture and uh, loving each other's culture and knowing folk music. Also folk besides classical and, and traditional training. And uh, I have been a fan, also a fan, like I grew up uh, singing a lot of folk music yeah. in, in China. And uh, just knowing that many songs and uh, you can, there's so much you can work with. Um, so that's um, another just to, you know, I think it's all nutrients. When I feel healthier, like when we exercise and when I eat better, yeah. we, our body knows. That's right. So we feel happier. So that is the principle. Yeah. So that's kind of where I just like, all right, I want to be more happy. So, okay, let's uh, find an opportunity to get the happy ingredients together. Oh, <laughs> uh, I love that. I love that. I love that. Uh, any, anything that you, you wanted to talk about that we missed? Uh, I just like to say that... Um, also, oh, Abby and I were releasing a record. Awesome. Uh, That's next, great news. Uh, next spring, we're still working on the, all the po post-production produced by Bela Fleck. And uh, so it's coming out next week. I mean, not next, next year. Next year. <laughs> next year. <laughs> wow. Uh, and then um, Hello Go Mountain, we're going to you know, take it to... Um, are, are you taking it on the road? Uh, uh, that's the plan. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. That's the plan. It's not an easy piece to take on the no, road, you know. No, so, no. but but it has really touched so many different communities. So there is a big interest. So I'm working with my manager to actually to get it there. It um, is so special. It's such a special piece of art. Yeah, it really thank is. You. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's incredible. And uh, so that's uh, so far the two major um, productions that, that that's gonna you know, like blossoming next to the coming years. And, uh, and then, uh, just, you know, looking after my parents and, uh, um, my children yeah. and, uh, doing more, uh, also to, to be involved more in the, our community and, uh, do more volunteer work for schools. That's really, um, with Chatterbird, uh, we also will do more school visit, uh, so uh, to share also Hello Goat Mountains, the history, not only the history, but to really relate to what we are going through and how sh we should prepare ourselves for the future yeah. and uh, to, to bring people together and uh, to, to keep children's mind open. Hopefully, yeah. They're, they're open-minded. Yeah. The, the, usually the older they get, kind of like, so we, we try to keep them open. That's our job, I think. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad we were able to do this. Thank uh, you, Marcus. Yes, thank you for doing the show. And uh, until next time, peace. Thank you. Thank you.